continuing through our uh, series on the Beatitudes, when Jesus is, gives a Sermon on the Mount in the first part of the Beatitudes, the blessings, and I was reminded uh, we've gone to the Holy Land on several occasions. I think I've been there three or four times, and uh, the Sea of Galilee is a beautiful and picturesque area there uh, where Jesus is on the mountain, northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus has, uh, is, according to the scriptures, shared the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. He was in chapter 4, we see that Jesus of Matthew, chapter 4 Matthew that is, that Jesus has been healing people and of all kinds of illnesses and diseases and the hordes and hordes of people just coming and coming. So Jesus goes up the side of the mountain and the crowd follows him. And he sets up somewhere around the Sea of Galilee on the mountainside. And when we've been there, uh, we've taken a boat right across. And I just uh, remember uh, one time, Reverend Coppedge, when the boat stopped, he led us in a devotional and we all sang. And, and I even joined in. I sounded pretty good on the water. Amen. Praise God. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Amen. But it's uh, truly to sit there in the calmness of the Sea of Galilee and the on the boat and right across the Sea of Galilee. Now, there's a, there's a, a church of the Beatitudes on top of the mountain there, and it's one of the sides, and we go there, and it's an it's a eight-sided building, octagonal building, because it represents the eight Beatitudes. But it's beautiful, it's picturesque, and we've been there many times, and uh, go inside for a tour, we pray, and just soak in the moment. It's nothing like being there on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and, and, and then to say, this is where Jesus walked. And that's amazing. It's the people, when we go to the Holy Land, it's like, people say, it's like taking the scriptures from black and white to color. It just so comes alive. And to think that you're riding across the Sea of Galilee where Jesus also rode across. You're standing on the hillside somewhere in the area where Jesus has given the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. It's just, just awesome, reminding us all that Jesus has done for us and just, uh, just to be there. So anyway, so it kind of brings it back to life contextually as well as we continue our journey living the kingdom culture. Again, Jesus has, has been healing people at the end of chapter 4 of Matthew and chapter 5, 6, and 7 of the Sermon on the Mount. And chapter 4, four excuse me, chapter 5, the first part is the Beatitudes, those eight Beatitudes. And he's really tell, talk, he's gotten people's attention because he's been healing them and meeting a lot of their needs. He gets their attention. And then he shares uh, how to live as kingdom people. Yeah, you, you're in the earth and you've got worldly ways and you've been indoctrinated in the world and you've seen the evil in the world. But here's how we operate as citizens of heaven. As a matter of fact, Philippians 3.20 reminds us that, Paul, when Paul writes Philippians 3.20, reminds us that we're citizens of heaven. So when you come into Christ, you've got heavenly citizenship. And we're to act like, behave like, think like citizens of heaven. Because you and I are a taste of heaven on earth. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be in thy name, thy will be done as in heaven, on, as on earth, as it is on heaven, in heaven. So we are to represent heaven on earth. Amen? Pray. That's our, that's our assignment. That's our commission. So praise God. And today we want to raise up uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Amen. Living the kingdom culture. And if you've ever uh, had a moment when maybe you've been so busy during the day, you've forgotten to eat, to eat breakfast, forgotten to eat lunch, and all of a sudden those, your stomach starts to growl and you start to hunger, you haven't had anything, any water to drink or anything, and so you, all of a sudden you get cravings and maybe you're not at home so you can't run through the fridge and get some stuff, and so you're maybe in your car and, you get, and all of a sudden you, you, your eyes get big and say, I gotta eat, gotta eat, gotta eat, and you're hungry and thirsty, and you pursue that which will satisfy you. And get out of the way. I remember uh, one of the brothers telling me that when his wife was expecting their first child, that she had cravings. 
and, uh, and her cravings, no matter what it was, no matter what time it was, when she was having those cravings, got to have it, got to have it, got to have it, he would go out, if it wasn't in the house, he would go out and get it for her to satisfy her. And so on a, on a higher, a holier, and heavier level, we are to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We ought to have those cravings for righteousness. Mm, that that, that we, we're just, nothing can satisfy us except the righteousness of Christ. Mm. And so, as again, we looked at blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Amen. And to hunger and thirst for righteousness in an unrighteous world. Yeah, that's kind of radical because we, he's saying that no, you can't be like the world because you're representing heaven. We're representing Christ. We're his ambassadors. So we need to represent our home country, heaven. Amen. So we're to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Well, what is this righteousness? Now, it's, this is, I'll tell you what, it's not first, and then we'll tell you what it is. It's not the righteousness that when you trust Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that you are judicially declared righteous. That's a positional situation that uh, you're righteous. Matter of fact, Romans 5.1 tells us, therefore, since we have been declared righteous, I like the way the, uh, this, this version says it, the HCSB, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, says, therefore, since we have been declared righteous, that means that uh, as, as if a judge has a judicial act to give you a sentence, but he declares you righteous. You're guilty, but he said, no, because of, he has a power and authority, he declares you righteous, positionally. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 9 tells us, much more than since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him, through him from wrath. And so we've been declared righteous. So that's positionally. So when you trust Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, he takes upon your sin guilt upon himself. That's what he did on Calvary's cross. And he imputes to us, he declares us righteous. He gives us his righteousness. That's why we can stand for a holy God. That's why God takes our prayers under consideration when we pray. We have access to heaven because we have, we are righteous. God sees us without sin because he sees us with the imputed righteousness of Christ. So we're positionally right with God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It's kind of like being married. Uh, you've got the wedding ring. You've got the certificate on the wall. You went through the ceremony. So you're, you're married. Positionally, you're married. But each and every day, you got to act like you're married. Amen? You got, you get it. That's the personal marriage. Amen? You got the positional marriage because you got the ceremony, you got the pictures, you got the certificate, you said the I do's and whatnot. So you're positionally married. We married. Amen? But then each, oh, hear me now, each and every day, you got to Act like you're married. Act like you love the woman. Act like you love the brother, 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 brother. Amen. You got to act like it. Amen. You got to keep it. You got to work at it. Amen. It's personal. Amen. So this righteousness that we're talking about here is not the positional righteousness. Hey, you're in Christ. The heavens guaranteed. Praise God because you trusted Jesus Christ. It's what he has done for us. The righteousness, that righteousness you can't earn. You can't work for. It's freely given through Christ. But the righteousness that Matthew records that Jesus is talking about has to do with our personal righteousness. You're in Christ. You're a citizen of heaven. Now act like it. That's what he's saying. Personal righteousness. It, it's like to uh, do what God requires. Doing what's required to live a life that's pleasing to God. So, so you're in Christ positionally, like you're married, but then each and every day you got to live like you're in Christ. Personal righteousness. Working out, not working for, but working out your soul's salvation, amen? That personal, so you live like kingdom citizens, amen? Not like citizens of the world, because you've called, been called out of the world 
into the marvelous light. Oh, that's why we sing that song. This little light of mine, let it shine, let it shine. Yeah, all around my neighborhood, all around my family, all around my job, all around my church. Let my light shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, I wish I could sing, amen. Praise God, amen. So the righteousness we're talking about is, that Jesus is talking about here, is that we ought to be living out righteousness each and every day. Yeah. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That we pursue righteousness. We live righteously pursuing righteousness. Matter of fact, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. In other words, that, that when we come into Christ, we're babes in Christ. We're babes spiritually. We're babes righteously. Amen? So we've got to, it's something we can work at. We have to work at, have to practice. And how do we find out about righteousness? Through the scriptures. That's why we need to be in the word of God, to grow in righteousness. Amen? Or now, because if we're avoiding studying the Bible, we're not hanging out in Bible study classes, we're, we're not growing in righteousness, amen? The best way we can grow in righteousness, in righteousness to live like Christ would have us live, to honor God, is to be in the Word, amen? That's why we push the Word, amen? Praise God. So we will become addicted to righteousness, amen? Praise God. And we grow in righteousness. And you ought to be able to mark some time when you look back when you first started this walk with Jesus, where you were righteously as far as living out every day. And hopefully you've seen some transformation going on in your life. You've seen a change in your life. Amen? That you've been growing in righteousness. Amen. Proverbs 21 and 3 says, To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So we want to be growing in righteousness. So we've got something we got to do in our mindset, amen? Like the athlete who goes to the weight room. I remember when I was in the eighth grade, I was a puny weakling, amen? But as I went to the weight room day in, day out, summer and summer, when I got to my junior, senior year, I was pretty, pretty, pretty cut. Not now, but back then, yes, absolutely. Praise God, amen. I got bench press 300 pounds, amen, because I spent some time working at it, man. See, if you want to grow in righteousness, you got to spend some time working at it, practicing it, putting it into play, and doing what God tells you to do according to his word, amen. That's why you got to be in the word. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word, amen. Feasting on the word of God, Amen. Out with the old and in with the new. Amen. Praise God. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to walk and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So we live, it's about righteousness. So we must pursue righteousness and live righteously. Amen. Just like a hunter. Who goes out to hunt, pursuing, going after. Mm. So it's, it's like you can be on the sports team, you can be a member of the team, have the jersey, but guess what? They expect you to conduct yourself a certain way. Same thing in the body of Christ. You've got Jesus' jersey on, and we're on Jesus' team, and then we got to conduct ourselves in this world according to the righteousness of Christ, amen? A lot of you have been in the military, and you can have the uniform, have all the medals and everything, but you still got to live in such a way, according to the military code of hand, that right, 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 Colonel? Hey, absolutely, yeah. Otherwise, okay, yeah. So you can have the marriage certificate, but each and every day, you got to live like you're married, amen? No side chicks, no side dudes, Amen? Amen. If you can't live up to that, then you stay single and celibate. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And why do we want to? Why do we want to grow and pursue and thirst and hunger after righteousness? Why? Because it glorifies God in the earth. It honors God in the earth. Amen. It says, "I love the Lord." We can sing it, but can we love it every day? Amen. Each and every day, because we're citizens of Kingdom of Heaven. Amen. And so we're God's representatives on the earth, and we gotta live like it, and talk like it, and walk like it, think like it, act like it, treat each other like we're 
citizens of heaven, amen? Praise God. In season and out of season, amen? We've got to pursue righteousness. You know, uh, the Queen of England, you know, she's, wow, up in age. Wow. I heard she just got diagnosed with one of the COVID and whatnot, but said they're not, she's not uh, just minor symptoms. She's got minor symptoms. But I remember sometimes I would say they had these fox hunts in England. And they, all these hunters would be up with their, their guns and they let the foxes out. But they, but they also, while they were on horseback, they had dogs. They let the hound dogs out to go chase the foxes, amen. And those, those dogs are hunting, they're, they're pursuing, and they're, they're, I mean, they're sweating and, and they're just spending all this energy going after those foxes until they catch them and they hey, there it is, boom. My friends, we ought to be hound dogs for righteousness, amen. Just pursuing, don't let anybody get in your way, anything get in your way. Pursuing righteousness is one thing you can put in your mind, to pursue righteousness, and ask yourself, well, what am I saying or doing or thinking or talking or saying about someone else? Is it righteous? If it's not, get rid of it. And see, see, this is not passive. No, this is not passive. You've got to be active. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to want it. You've got to hunger and thirst. I mean, Jesus gets pretty graphic. He says, he didn't say, well, just, just go, kind of just walk along and, and it'll come around. Da, da. No, he said, you got to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because if you don't set your mind on it, it won't happen. You keep living like the world. Yeah. Try to bring the world into the church. Act like the world in the church. Amen. But that's not honoring God. Amen. Yeah. It's like most people, when they want to go somewhere these days, they're unfamiliar, they're have a thing called GPS, and they'll put the destination, and then his voice comes over and says how to begin the route, and it takes you on the journey. In our Christian life, we need to set our GPS for righteousness. And as we take that journey, growing in righteousness to our destination, because guess what? We never stop growing in righteousness as long as we have breath in the body, Amen. Praise God, amen. We never stop growing in righteousness as long as we live on this side of glory, amen. And that's why we have to be careful. You can't hang out with everybody, amen, because bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good righteousness, amen. Bad company, my daddy would always tell us, son, be careful who you hang out with, amen. Yeah. Because you may not be doing something wrong, but it's going to rub off on you. One of my brothers used to play in a band in high school, and and he'd go out, now, and he'd come back, and of course my mom and dad would be waiting up until we was getting 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. They'd be waiting up, do, do a check on him, you know, do, you know, do the mom and dad check, amen. And my mom in particular, she would sniff him, because we, we would be in our bedroom, but we'd be listening, amen. <laughs> amen. It was, it was six of us, we'd be listening, what are they going to do to him, because he was the oldest, amen. And my, my mama, you smell like smoke. You been smoking, boy? You been smoking? No, mama, mama. But there was, there was smoke in the club where I was playing. Okay. But she did a check because he was smelling like who we've been hanging out with, amen? And when you hang out with unrighteous people, you be smelling unrighteous. And person, you be acting unrighteous. So hang out with righteous people. Let it rub off on you. You can't hang around with everybody. That's why if you're a married man, you got to be careful you hang out. You can't hang out with the single dudes that are running women. You can't do that because they're going to rub off. Somebody need to hear that, amen? Yeah. So you got to get some new friends who are living righteously. Man, I, I, I'm watching people in the church, and I said, wow, i just I'm amazed at their righteousness, amen. And it rubs off. We become like those we hang out with. Because when we break the holy huddle on Sunday morning and go out to the world, you might be all by yourself at times. you got to live righteously. It's called integrity. Are well, you living righteously? See, you, we can know integrity, but we got to show integrity. We, got to, we can know righteousness, we got to show righteousness, amen? Amen. To know is one thing, but we got to show it. In other words, we got to live it, amen? So we got to pursue like a, a reckless abandon. I got to have the, I, I got to have this thing. Nothing else is going to say. I got to have this righteousness, that dog of determination. I got to be righteous for God. Not legalistically, but from the heart, authentically, as we yield to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, as we can live surrendered lives, allowing righteousness to show up in our conduct, allowing righteousness to show up in our character, allowing righteousness to show up in our conversations and how we treat others. Again, that little light, 
This little light of mine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. That's the light of righteousness. Amen. Because, you know, light attracts. And God wants us to attract as we pursue righteousness and live righteously. Let that righteous light shine. That's what the world needs to see from God's church. You can remind it. But seek first, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not your righteousness, but his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. But Jesus saying that, hey, he, he knows those things we desire and crave for and, and want and are things we like to do and have. But he said, seek not last, but first righteousness. Mm, his right, kingdom righteousness. Yes. And all these things will be added unto you. Amen. First John 2.29, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So it, it's like, you know, in, in a household I grew up in, we all kind of have certain resemblances. Some things that we even sound alike because, you know, we, we hang out with each other. So the more you hang out with God, the righteous just exudes in you. When you surrender, I surrender or surrender all, surrender all to him. Yeah. We become like the one we focus on. So we got to be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Proverbs 4, 18, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. So let the light shine of righteousness. Amen. It's the light of heaven. Matthew 5 and 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. So set the GPS of your mind and your heart and your soul toward God's righteousness. Not the world. Because the world is uh, situational. It's get over, get even, and those kind of things. And stab people in the back and uh, take advantage of people. No, no, but God's righteousness. That's why we got to be in the word of God. So, if, so if, you, if you get one thing from this, be righteous. Be righteous. Be right. As a child of God, as a person representing the kingdom of God, be righteous. Tattoo that in your, in your mind. Be righteous and grow in righteousness. Uh, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. So that's, that's unrighteous stuff. That's what we learn in the world. That's how we behave in the world. But we're not people of the world. We're people of the word. So let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Here it is. Here's righteousness. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So set your mind and your feet will follow. You ever drive a car, and, and, and you're driving a car, and you pretty soon you're looking at something, looking at something, and pretty soon your car goes that way? Yeah. Put your mind on righteousness, and pretty soon your feet will go that way, your heart will go that way, your mind will go that way, your walk will go that way, your talk will go that way. Pretty soon you'll be living in right. Pretty soon people will be following you because you're the good model of right. Be righteous. Be righteous. He says, then she says, Matthew 5 and 6, for they shall be satisfied. I'm so satisfied. Oh, I wish I could sing, y'all. I'm so satisfied with my Jesus. You know, a side point, please, a side point. Uh, we were in a staff meeting the other day, and, and uh, Sister Tanya said, uh, because uh, when we did the baptism, get the certificate, I had my mask on, said, well, I was a little muffled. And she says, Pastor, we're going to get you a singing mask. I said, singing mask? Yeah, singing mask. I said, praise God. I called Robin and said, Robin, time to get me a singing mask. She didn't say a preaching mask, didn't say a talking mask. She said, a singing mask. So one day, that mask gonna has some magical power help me to sing. This is a side point there. Praise God. Amen. That's my story. Amen. Praise God. Every time I tell her, she goes, okay, well, that's all right. But anyway, for they shall be satisfied. Oh, man. 
in a couple ways. Satisfied because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're already blessed because of our relationship. No matter what we go through, we got to endure, we're already blessed. Because see, when you try to be righteous in an unrighteous world, it's going to hurt sometimes. From Jim Crow to Jane Crow to slavery to everything else. People trying to take your vote away and all kinds of stuff. Fair housing, health care disparities. And you still got to be righteous because you represent heaven. That's why we have the, praise God, the freedom to protest and make our, we can write our congressmen and all those kind of things. We, we need to do those things when we see injustice. But we don't become unjust in our righteousness. We got a higher plane, a higher level, because our righteousness is from heaven, representing Christ. So one, we're blessed in that we can know that even on this side of glory, even when we endure hardships, because we're walking in righteousness in an unrighteous world, God has a way of comforting us. God has a way of encouraging us to stand, to stand and do the right thing in a wrong world. But then also, God has a way down the road. He will give us all kinds of rewards. Yes. You will be satisfied, for they shall be satisfied. And we want to say that this, when we walk in personal righteousness, the Holy Spirit gives us confirmation no matter what people say about you and talk about you or criticize you for using scripture in public places and try to put you in jail and things like this. That's happened over in Finland. We say, that's incredible. So we got to be on guard here in the States as well. But God gives us his peace. We know we have his presence. He gives us affirmation. Hey, I've honored you. You've honored me and I'll honor you. Yeah. And so we got to do the, do the right thing in a do-wrong world. Amen. Yeah. For Christ's sake, amen. And then there, there are rewards, even in the face of mistreatment, uh, unfairness, dirty looks and dirty tricks. The world says, you do you. No, 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 because when you do you, you're going to mess up. You're going to get in the flesh, amen. But don't do you, you do righteousness. You do righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, amen. And I think about those uh, because, you know, when you do righteous and righteousness in an unrighteous world, uh, you're going to be tempted to do unrighteousness. I remember reading and looking at the stories of the 50s and 60s, the freedom bus riders and those protesters. They were schooled uh, how to behave when people would call them the N-word or antagonize them. They were schooled how to, I mean, they went through training sessions and to, to deal with their temper, anger, or, or their flesh doesn't want to fight back. But they were schooled, so when people attacked them, they were peaceful. They were in righteousness. Because right always overcomes bad or evil. So they, they were a model of right. People couldn't understand. Well, why aren't you fighting back? Why aren't you? Yeah, they were bloody, beaten and bruised and hosed and dogs sucked, sucked, sucked on them. And, but they maintained that righteousness. They were trained. They went to School to do that, training sessions. They knew the bigger objective. And, and you and I, we can grow in righteousness as we train ourselves in the word of God, surrendering. Why? Because it glorifies God. Yes, it glorifies God. And to know that God understands everything that you endure for his namesake. And he remembers, and he will more than repay for however you are disadvantaged because you stand for Christ. So whether it be on the workplace, or in the neighborhood, or in the voting ballot, whatever it might be, stand for righteousness. Mm. Matthew 5, 11, 12 tells us, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Look at it, on his account. Yeah. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, so, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before them. God more than repays. 
you will be satisfied. It's like when Robin cooks a good meal. I mean, all her meals are good. Okay. When all the wonderful meals. Yeah, help me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That quick edit. Some of y'all got that. She's not watching. She'll be the next server. I'll fix up by then. But, but so, so, I'm so satisfied. I just want to put a toothpick in your mouth. I just want to savor the moment. Just, just feel satisfied. You're, you're full, you know. You're content. Amen. Because you, you're, oh, I'm just so, you just wish you could stay in that moment because you're just so satisfied. Amen. And with our relationship with Jesus Christ, we're so satisfied because we got the peace of God and peace with God and we can stand on the promises of God no matter what you got to go through what you got to endure hang in there and then when, when you look back over your life look back over your grandparents life and your foreparents life hadn't God brought us a mighty a mighty long way and they did it righteously amen they didn't do it wickedly they did it righteously amen and let God lead you amen stand for righteousness amen a couple things I want to leave you with make a commitment for righteousness. Make a commitment to grow in righteousness. Because we got to make that commitment. Just like the, when I was in the eighth grade, a puny little dude, amen. I had to make a commitment to hit the weight room, amen. Amen. So make a commitment to grow in righteousness by, by studying the word of God. And make a commitment to show righteousness. Don't just keep it to yourself. No, no, no. Know it and show it, Amen. Make a commitment to study Christ's righteousness. Learn from Christ, amen. When get into the word of God and those who you're hanging out with. And make a commitment to yield to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict you when you're not doing right, amen. Now, now if you're not here feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, uh, you, you, okay, you may not be saved or you may have a seared conscience. And so you need to fall on your knees and repent quickly, amen. Uh, to forgive others and forgive yourself. Sometimes you're going to jump out there because it's new. You know, and all the freedom riders maintain their cool and control. They grew. Amen. Amen. So learn to forgive others and forgive yourself. But those times you've messed up, those times you didn't do, treat someone right, the time you said something you shouldn't have said, those whoops moments. Yeah. And then make a commitment to glorify God, our Lord and Savior. That's what it's all about. Because you're kingdom citizens living the kingdom culture. Kingdom citizens living the kingdom culture. God bless you, saints. Amen.